Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to take up the um, very interesting topic of why does doctrine matter in the Christian faith? Now, for someone like myself, who's automatically an egghead, dyslexic, is a no-brainer. Um, I want to know what the Christian church teaches. <laughs> and, of course, there are a lot of people who worry that if uh, really you get serious about doctrine, then other things will get neglected in the Christian faith. So let's begin by clearing the decks. <laughs> We're not going to set up an opposition between, say, doctrine and our own experience of God. Because <laughs> after all, if I have an experience of God, I'd like to know who this God is. And all that deep Christian doctrine does is begin to articulate <laughs> who the God is that you've met in the gospel and in your own experience. And the other contrast that you'll often get or competition that's set up with doctrine is, well, I really am much more interested in doing than simply thinking or believing. <laughs> so you set up a contrast between doctrine or a competition between doctrine and, say, the ministry and action of the church. But again, this is not going to get us very far because you're going to have to make decisions upon what kind of actions you're going to perform. <laughs> uh, is the church just going to be concerned about humanitarian work? Or is the church going to be concerned, say, about people's spiritual lives? And that's going to come back to questions like, well, what really are human beings? And what's gone wrong with the world? And is the problem just one of education or inappropriate politics? Or is there something much deeper, like, say, sin and alienation from God and that we've lost our way in the world? So what you get really fundamentally in Christian doctrine is that it'll begin to provide a mapping, an illuminating mapping, which then will make, help you to make relevant decisions as to the kind of actions that you would perform. Now, we could take that a lot further in terms, say, of the relationship between Christian commitment and what goes on in the political arena. Um, and that's a topic I think I'll just hold off for the moment. Now, my own uh, sort of further take on this is part of the problem is that the way we've actually presented doctrine. Um, and I think the early church is very instructive on this stage as to how it, it both developed its doctrines and and how it presented its doctrines. Now, of course, it, it began with the presentation of the gospel. So you, you've got to start there. And the gospel is the, the good news of the arrival of the kingdom of God in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and in the coming of Pentecost. <laughs> you can unpack that in, in very deep ways. And once you step inside that world, you're going to need, say, the scriptures, because the scriptures are going to give you the wisdom and the illuminating wisdom and teaching that you're going to need to make it in the world. Uh, and you're going to need to know who this Jesus is that brought the kingdom and is their Savior and is our Lord. And all of that, of course, will be contained within the Scriptures. But what emerges is that people need more than simply a brilliant book, a magnificent book, a book inspired by God. And they're like the folk in the Irish pub. And it's getting to the end of the day, and uh, you've got this wonderful sort of uh, teaching you want to embrace, and they sort of look at you and they say, you know, we want to know two things. Who did it, and did he get caught? <laughs> and so what you find the church doing, especially in, in its beginning in, in Paul and 1 Corinthians 15 and other areas, and Philippians, but what you find the church doing as it proceeds to evangelize the Roman Empire is that it has to provide a, a really good meaty summary of what the heart of the Christian faith is in its doctrinal teaching. And so what emerges is over time a creed, I believe in God the Father, I believe in God the Son, I believe in God the Holy Spirit. You add some bells and whistles to that. And basically what they're saying, often to an illiterate people, <clears throat> here's the scriptures, here's the practices of the church, here's baptism, here's the Lord's Supper, but you need actually a meaty summary. <clears throat> and if we don't give you a meaty summary, somebody else will. And the people who did that in the ancient world often were a network of people, very, very highfalutin, speculative people who were known as Gnostics, who said, look, we'll tell you what this stuff really means and give you the summary. And what, in fact, the great teachers of the church realized, following embryonic examples of this in scripture, is that the church needed to put together <coughs> its rule of faith, its canon of doctrine. And that's what you get in the Apostles' Creed, and eventually what you get in the magnificent creed of Nicaea, um, in, in the 320s and then updated with a section, longer section of the Holy Spirit in 381. And that's the only, if you like, official doctrine that's ever been uh, agreed by the whole church insofar as we can think of it in, that, in those universal terms. 
Now, I think the, the difficulty we have as one who teaches doctrine is most of the people who come have not gone through a process of initiation. First of all, where they've gotten a hold of the gospel and been converted. Then they've been given the meaty summary. <laughs> because once you get into the meaty summary, and this is what the early church discovered in, 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 in its ministries, is people want to know more. And they want to know more about, well, tell us more about the Father and how the Father is related to the Son and how do we understand the Holy Spirit and how does the death of Jesus, for example, who died for us, really bring about genuine at one moment and reconciliation, so on and so forth. So my view is that the best way to think about Christian doctrine, and indeed Christian theology, is that it's a higher level, and I would even say in some cases university level, catechesis. That's to say it's an unpacking in part of what you've already gotten yourself into. It's a bit like getting married. Now I've got to figure out how on earth I'm going to negotiate this amazing world that I've entered. And uh, the tasks then become ones of our articulation and understanding why the church committed to the Trinity rather than not. Um, how do you best understand, say, a doctrine of the atonement? Well, how are we going to think about life after death? Uh, part of the job is actually um, solving problems that are still with us. Um, famous problems like what's the relationship between grace and works in our coming to Christ? <laughs> which was a, a very profound question in the 4th and 5th century that still remains actually in place, and I think we can solve that one. Um, and a further ma major task is that uh, people attack Christian doctrine. They say this doctrine of the Trinity is incoherent, or how can you really say this about the death of Jesus when it seems so morally sort of unacceptable? So you have a task of articulating in fact, how best to think about these in ways that are not open to obvious objections. You're a kind of lawyer uh, who is sort of uh, uh, acting to defend the misrepresentation and inadequate accounts of it. And right at the far end of this is, in fact, a task that I've been trained to do and others do it as well. But actually, how do you defend the whole package deal? Um, how do you ground this in ways that are sort of really, truly um, uh, based on what we know to be the case about the world, on reason, on, and even on how do we relate our experience to all of this? How do you take it up into the world of divine revelation? And that's got a rather nasty, actually, uh, title. It's called The Epistemology of Theology. <laughs> and I'm working on a, the Oxford Handbook of the Epistemology of Theology. And it's not a disease. <laughs> it will be expensive until they bring it out in paperback. But that's where, in fact, you then do uh, this really interesting work of saying why you believe what you believe and how you can ground it in a way that, that actually can go as far as anybody wants to take it. And the marvel and wonder of the church is that down through the centuries they've never backed off these questions, and which is why I think if you get into Christian doctrine, um, you're not going to have an easy life, but you're certainly not of a boring one.